Nicoletta, we've all been there. Mm-hmm. Like, we can relate to what it's like to have this baby project, this thing you care so much about, and you think everybody's gonna think your baby's beautiful, but the reality is they don't care about your baby at all. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the show, Brian. How's your morning going? Hey guys, man, it's it's awesome. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really really excited to be here. Yeah, we really enjoyed the book. We actually found your TED talk, so we'll dig into that a little bit. And then, of course, it is our Q and A episode this month, so we're going to be digging into our listeners' questions around networking, a topic that is very near and dear to your heart as well. So tell our audience a little That's bit right. about yourself, Brian. You know, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, and. Uh, I, the way that I did that was through music. And so related to, to some of your story, probably Johnny, some of your story is, you know, writing songs, yeah. playing on the weekend, you know, started in, in early high school. And I and did that all the way through college. And uh, my freshman year of college, I was in a life-changing car accident. I went to this little college in Canada. Icy roads, couldn't stop, you know, got T-boned. And three doctors told me I shouldn't have lived and I'll never walk again. And it was in it was in that that period, that transitional period of like, how do you deal with that kind of diagnosis? Five days in the hospital and just really having that time as an 18 year old, which most people don't take that time to really think about who am I and why am I here? And realizing that even if I don't ever walk again, I still have a voice and I can still make a difference. And so that led me to not only learning to walk again, but but now I've done five marathons but also looking at like, what's the, my purpose and realizing like my purpose is people. And I, I became a teacher, became a school teacher. So I kept doing the, the, the music stuff, but I realized in, in the guitar lessons that I would offer to kids and even Sunday school class and like summer camp, like where I felt like the most alive, but also my highest contribution was in giving back to students. And so for, for almost 15 years, I was a classroom teacher and then I had the opportunity to start a charter school which, which was like like a startup, you know? So, so for those of you listening right now that are entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, <laughs> you know, thinking about your business, um, you know, there's a, it's, it's pretty awesome to do it within something that you really love, uh, within an industry that you really love. And so I got to do that and that led to more speaking, writing, consulting. So that's what I do now full time is I encourage people to find their voice, figure out their audience and figure out their message. You know, it's, it's certainly, an, to have a life altering event at such an early age certainly straightens you out to look for to get the most out of the rest of the life knowing that you you escaped so narrowly and it's it's tough to watch young kids now where you 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 want them to see those opportunities now without having to have that that event which is utterly terrifying it's a roll of the dice and you know i and watching your ted talk and doing some research for this knowing that you found this impossible mission as an opportunity to f- grow some confidence. Could you share some about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the confidence part is, is funny. I, I work with clients every day. I do, I do coaching. I call it clarity coaching. And, and often they lack confidence. And the reason they lack confidence is because they're not, they're not clear. They're not clear on their audience, their message, or their products. And so they're they're second guessing themselves. It happens, it happens every mm-hmm. day. You know, I'll, I'll get a message from a coaching client or one of our, our members of our writing community who's, who's scared uh, and they don't have that confidence. And I really believe your purpose is people. By, by, living, out, um, by living out your purpose, by serving people, I, you know, in the book I call it start with your people, by starting with people, like looking at the people in your life right now, and just asking, you know, what can I do to make your day? Or I, I, my favorite question is, what are you working through? Like, what are you working yeah. through right now? I had a few people reach out to me on Instagram over the weekend. And so my message back to them, they click that aud- little audio mm-hmm. button. And I just say, hey, like, thanks so much for your message. I really appreciate it. What are you working through right now? And the messages I get back from strangers, like people that, that I don't know and they don't know me, but realizing that when they say, what are you working through? I'm like, I can, I can help you with that. And so that's where I think the confidence comes from is realizing that, um, I can make a difference, and it might not be this monumental, you know, New York Times best-selling featured cover of whatever difference, but it's a difference for the people that are already in my life. And what happens is, when I show up for people in my life, 
I get to meet new people yeah. and that's where the networking all starts. Yeah. And of course, we're going to delve a little bit more into finding a mentor and the right mindset. But one of the ideas you write about in the book is creating your own personal mission statement. And yes, I know even for myself, it sounds a little bit daunting to put together a personal mission statement. And uh, for our audience, who's maybe just getting started in their career as well, uh, doesn't have a lot of life experience, doesn't really know what they want to do with their career, that can also sound pretty daunting. So how does one go about creating a personal mission statement? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks so much for asking it. You know, imagine if you were to have clarity that each and every morning as you're starting your day, you know, you could look in the mirror and know exactly what your purpose is for the day. So I call that the mirror manifesto. And I actually have a little index card, so literally printed out, that I look at in the mirror each day. Many of my coaching clients have it in their car. And the first is three lines. And the first line is, you know how, and then this person struggles with this problem. So as an example, let's say, for example, that you, um, you, know, you, help, you help bands get booked, mm -hmm. just as an example, okay? You know how bands struggle to get gigs to grow their audience. Yes. So that's how your that's how your personal mission statement starts. For me, because I help authors and speakers, mine is, you know how authors and speakers struggle to clarify their audience, their message, and their products. And just by asking that question, it just, guys, it just, it sort of like sets my course for the day. It's like a rudder of the day. I read that one little question and I'm like, I, I know exactly what I need to do today. What do you think of that? Yeah, it's incredibly powerful and I think when you orient each and every day in that manner, it allows you to stay focused on the right things and actually see some forward momentum and movement, which is so impactful when we're trying to build our careers, we're trying to build our network, we're trying to grow as an individual. Yeah, so much. It's it, There's so many distractions today, <laughs> and it's so easy to get distracted by the news feed. So I would 100%, I'm sure you guys talk about this on other shows, but instead of starting your day with your news feed, right, really go deep, start with your own priorities, your own goals. And I, I, I don't know about you, but that's when I check my news feed for the first time is when I'm starting to get ready because I'm looking for a podcast to listen to or, I'm, or I, I open up my phone to look at some music, to listen to some music. And I'm just so tempted to go check that Instagram feed or that Facebook feed or you know whatever tool you happen to use. And so just seeing that purpose statement in the mirror is enough of a reset to remember what am I supposed to do today? I, I really like that. And I certainly know that I have lost out on productivity and, and days because I had woken up, opened up Facebook only to get angry within the first five minutes and then stew yes. on something for the rest of the day uh, because of that. And I also know what my days are like when I'm highly inspired first thing in the morning. Uh, and, and, and it's, you're setting it up and I, I really like that. And one of the things that I really enjoyed, uh, listening to your Ted talk was we do, we all get, uh, with so much technology at, at our disposal and we have a hard time using it for the tools that it that it is to for positivity and to bring things in our life, and it ends up being a tool that distracts us, upsets us, um, and, and as you were talking about opening up and flipping to Instagram, it's it's an endless feed. It's just going to continue on and on and on and on until you either get pissed off and shut it off or realize, oh, I am late for work, it's time to get moving. And what did you grab from it? <laughs> Probably uh, not much, unless you've curated your feed to such a point where it's just pulsing out positivity and hopefully you can get inspired by, by something. However, at least for me, I know that I need to be engaged emotionally in the, in the, the, in the content in order to pull something inspiring from it. And, a, and an endless feed of inspirational quotes certainly just doesn't do it for me. Yeah, it's, it's so true. So w w the solution, I, cause I feel like I've, I finally figured out the solution cause I just really struggled with that news feed for years <laughs> and years is, you know, you, you have to decide 
like this is how I'm going to use the newsfeed. This is how I'm going to use the tool. You know, you want to use the tool. You don't want the tool to use you. And and you know, the algorithm's set up to distract us. So as as a quick example, when it comes to music, I actually have a plan. And that might sound like super nerdy, but like I have a plan for what kind of music I'm going to listen to. And so what one of the things I like to do, like I love going to shows. I love going to live concerts. Yeah. And, and so I'll look up the set list because there's this amazing yep. website, which is like a set list wiki where people are mm -hmm. posting set lists of, of a band. And so we saw a show a couple weeks ago and I searched for the set list and I'm like, okay, those are the songs that this person is touring with. So I created a playlist <laughs> in, in my, my Apple music, but whatever you happen to use. And that's all I listened yeah. to for like the couple weeks going into the show. And I gotta tell you guys, I probably had more fun than anybody else there. <laughs> You know, because I knew exactly what song he would play at exactly what time. I knew almost every word. I mean, I didn't, I didn't memorize every song, but I, but I knew it and I felt it. And it hit me in the moment there. What if we could do that with the rest of our life? What if we could do that with our fitness instead of listening to all of these competing voices? If we just had a plan to follow, what if we could do that for our relationships instead of getting so distracted? We just had a curated feed of these are the people I'm meant to encourage. So I'm just going to focus on them. I really like that and certainly derive a, a lot of the value from the shows. I'm as we were talking, I'm, I'm, I love music. I go to shows all the time. I play in bands here in Hollywood and I'm in, inundated with new great music on a daily to yes. weekly basis. And I have yes. to write down bands that I like because I'm going to get flooded with a bunch more and that I'm going to start looking at, at the next week, the next day. And it's, sometimes I don't even have an opportunity to really sink in and listen to the whole album and I get distracted. So I really enjoy that. And it gives, uh, I'm going to try that. I think the important part here is creating some me time. Everything we're talking about yeah. here is creating space for other people's cries for attention, what they're posting on social, what's important to them. And that's how we get distracted and lose sight of what's important to us. So that mirror manifesto, reminding yourself every morning of why am I doing what I'm doing and walling right. off that Instagram feed or even your inbox. I know a lot of people, first thing, they check their email. And of course, your email is going to be full of people's requests for your time, what they need from you. And we don't spend enough time really thinking about, well, what do I need? What is my self care? What do I need to set the day up for success? Mm -hmm. And of course, that's going to follow with your network and with finding a mentor. Now, before we get started, if you want us to answer your question, we'd love for you to do just that. Head on over to the art slash questions. Leave us a message. You can also email us questions at theartofcharm.com or find us on social media at the art of charm to ask us your questions that make it here in the show. Now, the first question we got is from Muskin. I can create a great network of friends when I go to events out of state, but after the event ends, I find it challenging to stay connected to these individuals and maintain that same level of excitement and engagement with them months after. Now, Brian, what are your thoughts on this? I know conferencing and going to events is a big part of growing our network. It gives you an opportunity to leave your hometown and meet some people in a fun environment, but it can be definitely challenging following up with people. That's such a good question because I, I, I love when you get to meet people in person. Like we build relationships through shared experiences, especially guys, like guys tend to build relationships based on shared experiences. So think about it. What works in person, uh, what works offline also works online. So what, what I'd challenge you guys to do is once you built that connection at a conference or, or out of town is what's the next shared experience that you're mm -hmm. all going to have. So as an example, you know, I, I had a, a milestone birthday uh, about a year ago, and I invited all these lifelong friends to come to Charleston, South Carolina. We rented a beach house. We went flyboarding. Like, it was this incredible experience. And most of these guys had never met each other before. And and I, could, I kept hearing them saying, man, we need to stay in touch. We need to stay in touch. And I was thinking, there is no way these guys are going to stay in touch because that's what we all say at conferences. And so here's what we did. Before we left, before the first guy got in the Uber to get back on a plane to, to leave, we looked at conferences that were coming up that we were all excited about. We picked one. This was so October to February. So whatever, however many months that is, but something to look forward to. 
And then the guys had the option to sign up or not. And I think five guys of the 12, five guys signed up for that conference. And what happened is they maintained their relationship through text messaging. My favorite uh, app is called Voxer. It's like a voice yeah, yeah. voice messaging <laughs> app, right? It's awesome. So, they, so we started a little Voxer group of guys that were going to this next conference. So I think the answer is just like when you look at dating, like – you always want your date, your your mm-hmm. you know your girlfriend or whatever, to have something to look forward to. Like, hey, babe, I just got tickets for this thing in three months from now. Guess what? She's stoked for three months. She's so excited about what's coming up for three months. And it works in dating. I think it also works in networking relationships. What's something you can look forward to three to four months from now and, and then have that shared experience again? And it doesn't even have to be an event. You could literally put something yeah. on the calendar when everyone has that momentum and they're excited and say, hey, let's do a 90-day accountability check-in. It could be a Google Hangout. It could be a Zoom. And then once it's on people's calendar, as it gets approaching, they're going to feel some pressure like, oh, I don't want to back out on this because, yeah, life is busy, but I promised these guys, these gals that I was going to attend this and we were going to support each other. That's one great way. And I think the other one that's really key is if you had that great moment, share the moments that you remember it, that it jumps to mind. If you remember outside of the event, there was this amazing homemade ice cream place. You guys had some ice cream after the event and you had a great conversation about something. The next time you're eating ice cream, be like, oh, I was just thinking about we were in San Diego and we had that great ice cream conversation. When we share those memories with other people, I mean, there's an app called Time Hop. People mm-hmm. love this. When they can think back to that moment they met you or they had some fun with you, that's how you stay in their life. And of course, taking what you said earlier, being helpful, being generous with your time, being generous with information. If you remember at that event that someone was struggling to start a podcast and you read a great article about the tools you need to start a podcast, share it with them. That's how you stay in their life and that's how they feel excited that you are in their life because you're supportive and you're helpful. I think a lot of us are always looking for that moment of like, well, what can I do or what should I do? A lot of this stuff is really simple. It's not hours and hours of your time. It's not every single week checking in, but being thoughtful and making sure that those shared experiences you had at the event, those memories, as they come to your mind, you share them with the group. I love it. That's awesome. When, one other quick thing, you know, one of my friends and mentors, Dan Miller, he has this, he has this brand called 48 days, the work you love. And I love that idea. Like there's this rhythm to, to your life. And so as an example, one thing I do is when I meet somebody really cool, I will open up my phone, I'll, I'll press Siri and I'll just say, Hey Siri, remind me in 48 days to follow up with so-and-so. And then I get this random reminder. It feels really random. And so pick a, pick a time, maybe it's 17 days from now, you meet somebody at a conference and you say, hey Siri, in 17 days from now, remind me to reach out to and then say the person's name. Just those little reminders coming in throughout the day is enough to keep that relationship going. Yeah, I mean, let's use the technology to help with connection instead <laughs> of distracting us. And, and it can when totally. used properly. And the last thing we talked about this on an earlier episode this month, this idea of planning other a little events, group gatherings at the big event, you know? So like there's a, a marketing conference, traffic and conversion summit, thousands of marketers are there. And of course you're gonna see familiar faces from the year before and the year before and the year before. But we like to plan little tiny events, like go out to dinner before the event starts, go to an escape room, go to the baseball game, whatever the case may be, to get that small group back together outside of the conference where we know we're gonna be distracted, we're gonna be, oh, I gotta go see this talk, and oh, I gotta go run to this room, or oh, maybe I'm speaking. So it's the time before and after the event, and everyone tends to arrive a little early or, or hang out a little bit longer, that you can create those shared moments and memories again if you know that you're gonna be at an event together. I, I love it, AJ. You know, the, the first time I ever hosted an event like that, it was at, uh, it was at a marketing conference, and uh, I didn't know anybody. I was just getting started in the online marketing space. I think it was social media marketing world like five or six years ago. And I, and I realized that most people have their day planned, but they don't necessarily have their breakfast planned yeah. because they're out of their morning routine. So I called up a local, uh, a local breakfast restaurant there in San Diego. It was a, a, a broken egg cafe or something like broken yolk <laughs> cafe. And I said, hey, how much would it cost for me to like rent a room for breakfast? And they're like, breakfast? And I said, yeah, like I'd like to rent a room. And they said, oh, we don't even charge anything. You just have to pay for breakfast. So then I like looked at their online menu and I realized most breakfasts are only like six to eight dollars. And if I have 30 people in the room, like that's a, an amazing uh, investment 
in some of the you know the the premier people in my in my industry. So I bought the domain name Epic Breakfast Club. <laughs> I sent. I sent a, an invite to all these speakers that I'd never met before. I had a couple people step up and say, hey, I'll come and I'll invite a couple people. And so we had like 32 people that showed up for this breakfast. It was a couple hundred bucks, which I know for, for many of you, like that's a big investment in your business. But I have to tell you the ROI on those relationships and on that one breakfast has, has paid dividends for years and years. And and most conferences don't have any kind of plan for breakfast. So having a 6.30 in the morning or seven o'clock, or we, I think we did it at 7.30 in the morning. I've now gone on to do it about a dozen times and every single time I make a new connection, build a new relationship and find another way to serve another person. Yeah, and wow. I, I mean, beautiful on the breakfast. Yeah. That morning routine for some, if they, they fast, go on a run, go to yoga, just plan. It's a little bit of planning. Right. And when you piggyback off of the event, remember, the event spent tens of thousands of dollars on marketing to get ticketers, to get attendees, to get people uh, on stage. And of course, they're bringing all these people together, creating that little sub event. That's easy. That's low lift for you because everyone's in San Diego. Everyone has a free morning. Do a little bit of homework. And sure enough, you're going to find and coming up here, we got another question from a student that you can have an impact on big name influencers in your industry simply by taking the time to gather people, put a plan together, help them. Next question here is from Raul. He says he's a university student and I love networking, but how do I reach out to the greatest, biggest influencers in my industry, given I am a student and there isn't much I can offer them? I feel like this is right in your wheelhouse. This is something you covered in the book. We get this question all the time. I'm excited to hear your answer. And I know Johnny and I have some points as well. Love it. Yeah, you guys are the masters, so I'm sure you'll have a lot to say. I wrote a whole chapter about this one specific issue. It's chapter 11, and it's show up and serve. Mm -hmm. So Raul, like, first of all, dude, like you need to know you have a ton to offer. And and the key is to fix what's broken, to look look around and to see with that with that influencer that you want to serve that person you want to connect to just look around and, and realize that they have goals that they ha are trying to accomplish something when there's one gap that you will see because what's obvious to you is magic to other people so when you show up to their live event or when you show up to the networking thing like wherever you interact so but in person so let's say you, you pay to go to this conference. This, this is my story. I pay to go to this conference. The, it was being led by this influential person. And I'm like, I would really, really love to work with him. What can I do? Well, I looked around and I realized that nobody's filming it. I was like, how is nobody filming this conference? That's my obvious magic. I, I know that anytime you're, you're talking, anytime you're creating any kind of content, you might as well film it. You might never sell it, but at least you can capture mm -hmm. what was said in the room. Otherwise, it's gone forever. So at the end of the conference, I said, hey, this was amazing. I would love to come back. Would you consider allowing me to film it for free and just giving you the master files? You can do whatever you want. I just want to serve you. He's like, are you kidding me? You'd let me do that or you, you would do that for me? So I ended up staying at his house, true story, ended up staying at his house, filming the next conference. And at the end of that second conference, he asked me to give a little 10 minute talk about some tips for filming. And that led to me speaking at the conference three more times. So Raul, just show up, see what's broken and offer to fix it. Yeah, I mean, those gaps are so helpful. And so many of these influencers, people who are trying to grow their brand, who are a few steps ahead of you, they still have those gaps. They have a team of yeah. people. There are going to be typos on the website. There's going to be mistakes. There are going to be, oh, the show notes aren't as good. I could do better show notes. If you listen to the podcast, you go to the website, you go, hey, you know, I notice you don't have transcripts. I'll transcribe it for you. These are all things that you don't need a high skill to do, but they are gaps in other people's lives that you can fill. And when you fill that gap, of course, they're going to offer you the world. They're going to be so thankful and appreciative that someone found this and made it better because of course mistakes happen. I mean, we've sent emails with typos. We've made mistakes on our website. Buttons aren't working. Those are invaluable. If you can point them out in a helpful way and say, Hey, let me lend some support. You know, we've brought on illustrators to help us make memes of the show mm -hmm. because they simply reached out. We've had people reach out and go, oh, the intro to your YouTube videos. I love video. I can help on that. Those little tiny pieces, and you may think they're insignificant, but they really do pay off in that influencer's live. And if you can be the one to 
offer that help, you're going to stand out from the crowd when everyone else is asking for their time instead of adding to their life. You know, we talk about this concept of adding value to people instead of taking value and making requests of people, demanding their time, demanding their attention. That's taking away from them. That's taking their valuable time. So instead you're like, Hey, how can I add to your time? Look, I made this easier for you. I helped you out. And remember back in, in the day we had that sh uh, episode with Jay Shetty. We had one mm -hmm. of our fans of the show literally try to get a meeting with Jay Shetty, trying to, to set up some time to see him. And he's a busy guy. And he's like, well, you take Ubers between locations, right? Jay's like, yeah, of course. He's like, well, I'll share an Uber with you. Boom, right? Who wouldn't want to share an Uber and have a conversation while they're waiting in traffic? Mm -hmm. So there are always these little moments where you can add value to someone who you think is two, three, four steps ahead of you. And when they get that value from you, they will be ready to serve you and to help you out in whatever you need. Make that connection, make that introduction. And sometimes it even leads to a job. Uh, the other thing there is it was certainly the, the first point that you were making as well. Show up. A lot of times we've already put the hurdles in front of us and to talk up this person. Um, I'm, I chat with quite a few people through social media and have developed relationships with them because they wrote and said they really enjoyed the show and they write me every week to let me know what the, how the show affected them and what points they got and, and to cheer us on. And I remember uh, one of the people that I chat with, they're like, I thank you so much for taking the time to always reply to my, my, my chats. And I was like, you know, I think people think we're, con we're, we're so busy when actually, you know, the amount, it, it's not very much that I, that I, people write me to ask questions. And it, it, I think we put these hurdles up in front of us. And so we don't have to put ourselves out there. We do it all the time. And for the people who I have developed these relationships with, I do the same thing. If, if I like your podcast and I listen to it, I, I find your info and I write you. I want you to know if I, if your band comes through my world and it hits, I write you. And, and, and I laugh about this because I've written so many bands and obviously I don't get replies from everyone, but the ones who do, you know, they now, and this could be some obscure band from some little village in the middle of Italy. And now they have this, this person from Los Angeles who, and who's written them. Who's like, Hey, anytime you're coming to America, let me know. I love your band. I'm, I just bought a shirt. Like they're over the moon thrilled. That is the one thing that can also to put them in a position where they might have been thinking about folding it up. Is anyone out there listening? Does anyone out there care? And I can tell you as an entrepreneur, there are days, there's days where AJ and I feel beat up from all the work that we're putting in. And it's that one email, that one message. They're like, Oh yeah, that's, that's why I'm working through and haven't had lunch and I'm bitchy today, but it's because this for these results. So good. I love that. Yeah. Don't say no for other people. Like don't assume the no, assume, assume the yes, assume that they're going to be excited to hear from you because often they are. And when you show up exactly that point and you do a great job on those show notes, you create an illustration, there's other work that, that they need support with. And they're going to think of you first of like, Hey, do you think yeah. you could just help me run my Twitter? Or, hey, do you think you could uh, create some more video content for us? Those doors open up by just taking a little bit of effort and energy to be generous and help that person that's a few rungs ahead of you. And a lot of times getting that foot in the door can mean getting access to their time in meaningful ways. And all of a sudden they're going to show you the ropes and you're going to learn more and that it could become an internship and even a job. Got a message here from someone who's struggling with the coworker, struggling with people in their lives. We get this a lot. Hey, AJ and Johnny, I have a question that's not related to networking. I hope that's okay. And you can answer it anyways, because this problem is having a big impact on my life. I've started a new engineering job three months ago and it's a great job, but there's just one problem. One of the senior engineers in my team is a real pain and extremely hard to work with for him. It's his way or he won't cooperate. He seems to be very good at what he's doing and everyone is kissing up to him. But the moment he leaves the room, the gossip starts. He's with the company for a long time and apparently very good at what he does. So he has the upper hand in any argument. 
I don't feel comfortable with the gossip, but I also don't feel good about him running the team as if he's the king of the world. Any ideas on how I can address this situation? I've thought about talking to HR, but since I'm new to the company, I don't want to rock the boat. Plus, I think I wouldn't be the first one anyway. Dealing with difficult people. It's got to be a common okay. theme for you as well. Oh, I love it. You know, I've... I've, I've had difficult people in my life and I know probably all of you listening right now have like one person if you just think about like who is somebody in your life if you had like a magic key that would like change them you know like a, like you could flip the switch from off to on like we can probably think of somebody right now in our life that's oh I, I wish I could just run their life for a day and their whole life would be better like I change their attitude or change their demeanor I change their facial expression or I would like eliminate this one word that they say all the time there's we're when we deal with people there's people that drive us crazy um, I had somebody like that I've had many people but in the book I tell a story about this guy I call him Melvin and the reality is we all have Melvins sure. in our life we all have these these people that just drive us absolutely crazy and really similar um, to the question he was he was at the next level in in the in the organization so I, I wasn't reporting directly to him but he had more authority than I did and there was nothing that I could do to change him and uh, and I didn't handle it well I totally failed that relationship and I felt terrible because a few months after I, I finally like moved on to another job he had a major heart attack and I just I looked back I I tell the story in the book but I I, I had this big blow up with him uh, where like I basically went around him to try to fix this problem that I thought that he was creating you know that was my perspective and and he reamed me out and I reamed him right back I mean I yelled right back at him and what I realized in the moment is I sunk to his level and uh, and looking back on that I just I never made that situation right and then he had a big heart attack. And I regret, it's one of my biggest professional regrets is the way that I dealt with, I call Melvin, the way that I dealt with Melvin. So I'd say my, my advice is to look at that person and to realize that there is somebody in their life who actually thinks they're awesome. There's somebody in their life, maybe it's their spouse, maybe it's their dog, you know, maybe it's when they're kids, but somebody sees that person you're dealing with in your life, that difficult person, somebody sees that person as, as like they're incredible. And I'd say, what can you do to discover what makes them incredible? Because if I was really honest with myself, I would have realized, wait a second, Melvin fought in a war. Like he was a veteran, you know? He showed up for our country and he kept us safe. Like how arrogant of me to deal with him the way I was. And he also had some really big like family drama that I found out about later. He was dealing with like this really rebellious teenage son who was getting into drugs and all this stuff. Like think about what would it have actually been like to be Melvin in that moment. And then there's this young teacher who's always on his case and is always asking for extra stuff. And so just realizing like they have a perspective too. And one of my favorite phrases is, can we clear the air? So I'd say, go, don't go to HR, go to the person and say, Hey, can we clear the air? Like, I just feel like we got off the wrong foot. Like maybe can I buy you lunch? Can I, can I bring you some coffee? Like, can we clear the air? And just doing that, I have seen it just disarms people because they know the air's not clear either, right? They realize that there's something weird. And sometimes people want to say they're sorry or they want to change, but it takes one of us to decide to make that change. And you can be that person. Yeah, I 100% agree. Empathy here is key. A lot of times people yeah. who are being difficult at work are bringing something else from their personal life with them to work yeah. that we typically are not even thinking about. We just think oh, this is them and their job, especially when you're starting a new job. And he hit the nail on the head in this question. Do not engage in the gossip. That does not serve you. Talking negatively behind someone's back, engaging in, in the conversations like that when they're out of the room does not serve you. Let's also unpack this a little bit. He's really good at his job, right? He doesn't have the soft skills, but he's really talented at his job. So how could you serve him? What could you learn from him? Invite him to coffee and say, you know, you're at a place in your career that I hope to get to. I'd love to be a better employee and I'd love to figure out how you were able to get to that level. Let him share his story with you. I bet in this situation, especially in this company, the way people are talking behind his back, that he gets the cold shoulder from a lot of people. They don't actually care about him personally. They don't actually want to take the time to listen. You going and having a cup of coffee, having lunch with him, he may share with you what's going on in his personal life. 
difficulty with my kids. I'm going through a nasty divorce. Oh, I, I'm foreclosing on my house. And now all of a sudden you're going to have clarity of like, you know what? He's not being rude to me. He's simply struggling to deal with this other thing in his life. And now you don't have to personalize it, right? A lot of times when we feel like someone's being rude, we think, well, they're being rude to me. And this is all about me. And then we carry that with us. A lot of times when people are being rude and difficult as a coworker, it's because something else in their life is nagging them. We don't have clarity on it and we're personalizing it. And of course, you may also, having that cup of coffee, realize, oh, there is a lot that I can learn. Oh, he did this and this is how he got promoted and this is exactly how he set himself apart and this is actually what his boss cares about, right? Because clearly, if he's a top performer and he's sticking around in the job, there's a lot to be learned from him instead of talking behind his back and certainly going to HR and saying negative things about his people skills is not going to set you up for success. The other thing that you have to keep in mind as well is everyone's temperament is different. And we like to think that everyone's like us because, well, that's the only way we have to view the world is through our senses. And so we're, we can't understand why someone's acting in a certain manner because, well, we wouldn't do that. Well, yeah, but we're not that person. And temperamentally, they're just different. And I have met a lot of pers people temperamentally who are just hard asses just and they're very rigid in their thinking and how they go about things and it comes off as as cold or uh or very uh, very stone walled uh, projections and the, and the thing about it is they have their ways about going about things however if you learn about them it opens up a lot of things and and you can only have empathy and compassion through understanding so you have to learn about the other person and one of the things I want to point out in this question is where he says, I thought about taking this, talking to HR, please take the person out to the coffee or try to learn about them and try to have some empathy first, because that's a whole nother can of worms that puts both of you in trouble at work. Yeah. And, and if it truly is a personal thing, can I clear the air? allow the opportunity for that conversation to happen and, and you apologize and take ownership of your actions instead of looking for that person, especially who's senior, who has experience at the company when you're just starting out, uh, you can put yourself in a very difficult situation if you just go running to HR to complain. Alex sent us this message from Twitter. How do you network online? I'm living in a small city and it's just after college for me, I have no funds to travel to events or conferences, unfortunately. Yeah, we've, we've covered a couple ideas already. You know, Alex, one of the best things that you can do is, is just show up on the radar of the people that you want mm -hmm. to connect with. And, and for those of us that are creating content, we check our comments, yep. you know, we, we check our, we check our DMS and Instagram. We check when people comment, when we check, when people leave a rating or a review on a podcast. And so that's just a great way is to lead with service, to look at something that somebody's posted. And, you know, let's say they just post on Instagram and first of all, following them, you're just following them alone. It's like a lot of people, when you get a follower, right? Especially if you're, if you're big, if your following's not that big right now, you're like, who's this new person? And you're going to go want to check them out. And then to send a DM and just say like authentically, you know, Hey, I love that last post. It was great. This is how it's helped me. So that's number one is just to uh, comment. Number two is to be their best student, to become a case study. So if they have a course or if they've ever done a talk, you know, a lot of times it'll show up on YouTube. Maybe they spoke at a conference. Now you can go watch that talk on YouTube or whatever. Implement what they're talking about and then send them a message and say, hey, I was at that keynote that you did at a conference last year. Here are my notes from it. And I wanna let you know, this is what I did and this is the result. You know, I still do this in, in, in my world. I'll leave uh, testimonials for people. So this is maybe number three, or at least part of number two, is to, is to say, hey, I love this program. Shoot a little video or, or write up a little blurb and send it an email and say, if this would help you, I just want to say, and then like leave that comment. Yes. You know, this program has really helped me. So those things alone, you'll get on that person's radar for sure. Didn't we just talk about this before we started? When people go out of their way to give you advice, please show them that you implemented it and how you did that. It makes them feel so good that, that you are the best pupil, that you are listening, that you're taking this seriously. Uh, we had just gotten some great advice uh, over the, 
the yeah, last week. And, working and, with an executive coaching client of ours and focusing on his social life, and he was getting a lot of benefit out of it. So he asked us exactly that. What are you guys working through? And we shared with them some of our marketing struggles. And now this is a guy who runs a multinational company, and he sat there at dinner, and for two hours, he's spitballing with us our marketing. Now, to get his time, to spitball our marketing. If we had sent him a cold email and said, hey, can you go through our marketing funnel? He'd say, absolutely not. But we were of service to him. He got results from the coaching and then he's like, okay, what can I do to help you out? And this is just such a classic yep. example. And then following through on that advice, whether it's grabbing a cup of coffee with your coworker or it's going to lunch or it's asking the speaker after the talk for a few minutes, follow up with them and tell them exactly how you did mm -hmm what they were talking about on stage or what they were talking about at lunch and how it helped you is how people become your mentor. They want to know that if they spend time with you, you are going to be their best student. You are going to be invaluable to them. They don't want to waste their time. And they, much like Johnny and myself, and I'm sure you, we get asked so many questions and so many people wanting our time. And they, they have this unique situation. They're different from everyone else. They need us to write back a three page email and they don't realize that if you're inundated with those requests, it's going to be very difficult for you to then say, Oh, I want to mentor this person. I want to take the time to mentor this person. But if that person says to me first, you know, I was listening to podcast 696. I implemented this. This is the result I got. And now my next struggle is here. I'm more likely to respond and answer and help that person than the one who's just like, I need your help. I didn't take any time. I didn't read any of your articles. I didn't listen to any of your podcasts. I didn't check out your YouTube. I just need all of your attention for this one problem. And, you know, we, we certainly do a lot of follow up with our clients and it's, it's so disheartening when the next time you chat with them and follow up and they're like, Oh, well actually I really didn't do any of it and I'm really depressed or I'm, a, I'm stuck here and I'm, a, and I'm upset. It's like, well, how do you expect to get any forward motion if some progression if if you're not willing to implement or make these changes and yeah it's 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 difficult and piggybacking off what you talked about earlier you know if you could take a video cut it up make a highlight reel for them make a a, vi a shorter video they could post on their social media out of their longer talk they might say hey you mind coming with me to this next conference? I need someone to shoot the video. I need someone to make memes. I need someone to transcribe my talk. All of a sudden you might get invited with your travel and ticket included because you were of service to someone else you looked up to. So those are some great ways to network online. Of course, cold LinkedIn, cold Facebook, cold Twitter and DM all work to a degree, but to really stand out from those people, is letting that person know how much they helped you and how their information paid off. And one f final small point to add to all that, if you reached out to somebody, they've given you some advice and let's just say, and we, everyone understands life happens, happens. Everyone's busy. Let's say that you had not had that opportunity to implement that and you were supposed to have a check-in, let them know, Hey, I gotten busy. I haven't had an opportunity to implement this. Let's talk in another week. Don't waste somebody's time of, of checking in when you know that your answer is going to be, well, I haven't been able to get to it. Julia has a follow-up question for the challenges that we gave last week. Hey, AJ and Johnny, thank you for the networking challenges this month. I've actually found a few people that I could bring into my network. Four of them live in different cities and two of them are actually living in my city. I want to use these connections to form a virtual mastermind group with them. And I could use some input on that from you. It's difficult for me to decide on how often we should meet and how long a meeting should run. I think this could easily become too much, but I also don't want to just meet once a month. Any suggestions again? Thank you so much. It's just six people that I found, but I can already feel how this is going to make a huge difference. I love it. Yeah. I, I, I have a chapter on, on your mastermind. And so I've got a little step-by-step -step process of how to create it. And I'd say one of the best things that you can do, Julia, is to set the rules and then invite them to come play the game with you. Because you think about like, if you ever host like a, um, a game night with friends, like they don't want to show up and then you say, okay, which game would you like <laughs> to play? And then you have like 30 options. Right. Yep. Like say, hey, we're gonna have a game night and here's the game we're gonna play. Let me go over the rules with you. People want clarity. Yes. 
And so if you reach out to these people and say, hey, listen, this is how I started my mastermind. Friday morning, 6 a.m., we're meeting here. We're going to meet for three months straight or whatever. We're going to meet. We're going to. We're going to take this 12 chapter book and we're going to meet for 12 weeks in a row. We're going to do one chapter of the book and we're going to talk about your questions and put some action steps in place. I'd say it's it allow you to test out that relationship to kind of see if it's a good fit. So you're not committing to years and years and years, but maybe there's a little project that you guys can do together. Like we were talking about before, people build relationships over shared experiences. So you set the table and then invite them to come eat. I love that. I think, again, the more clarity you have, the easier it is for people to say yes. The other thing I would add to this, since it's virtual and whatever platform you're using, for the most part, should allow you to record it. So you can say, I want to do this for 12 weeks. We'll record the sessions, so I'll allow you to miss one or two. But if you miss more than that, we're going to find someone else who wants to participate in the mastermind group. So that people sign up, they know, okay, it's a 12-week commitment. I'm going to meet every Friday morning at for 12 weeks. Oh, there's something come up. Okay, I know that Julia's recording this, so I can catch that one session. But I also know if I miss too many sessions that she's just going to find someone else. And then after that pilot, you'll know, well, you know, of the six people, we only had three show up every week. So maybe every week is too much. Maybe it should be every other week. And then you ask people, hey, why, why were you unable to make it? And if they say, well, I just didn't have enough time to get to the stuff we set up. I didn't really feel like I was making improvement. So I didn't want to waste anyone's time. Then, you know, you guessed wrong. But as you said, it's better to have clarity up front than to put a poll together and just kind of wing it and say, oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll do every other week. What do you guys think? Because people don't agree to those terms. People just be like, you know what? I I have other stuff going on. But when you're very clear, there's a start and an end date. You know the time ahead of time. It's very easy for people to commit to something like that. You know, it's interesting. I I know we've had this conversation where people ask for that time. And I can only imagine. So you you got these people to agree that, hey, I'd be interested to join your mastermind group. And then you start asking them all these questions like, wow, I got to put this together for you too? You're the one that asked me to join, and now you want do you want me to run it as well? So have all those things worked out. It's very important. Make it easy for everyone who said yes to just opt in and be a part of that. And when you think about those six people, is there a common goal that you all have, right? If that common goal is write our first ebook in, in 12 weeks or launch our first course in 12 weeks or build our website in 12 weeks, they're more likely to participate in a mastermind that has a clear goal in mind as well, instead of just a general mastermind. Because for me, with everything going on, a general mastermind where every week, I don't know what the questions are gonna be about, I don't know what we're covering, it'd be very difficult for me to commit to. But if I knew that at the end of 12 weeks, I'm gonna have a digital course launched, or we're gonna double our podcast listenership, or whatever that goal is, make it common amongst all the group members, and you'll find they'll be more committed, and they'll attend those meetings and don't be afraid to guess wrong. You know, it's your first mastermind. You might find that, Hey, weekly wasn't the right option, but try again, change it, tweak it and improve it. Here's a question we got at questions at the art of charm.com. Hello, AJ and Johnny. I have a long list of influencers that I would like to connect to, but I don't know how to get their attention. I'm just starting out with my own YouTube channel and I have nothing that I could offer to them. So I'm just one of the millions of fans that they have. Any suggestions on how I could stand out from the crowd? Thanks, The Lonely YouTuber. I love it, The Lonely YouTuber. (laughs) (laughs) Well, think about the skills that you have. You know, a little exercise that I get my coaching clients to do is to pick another person that's not in your industry. So my go-to example is my 93-year-old grandmother. And you take a piece of paper or a whiteboard and you write out a T-chart. So she's in one column, I'm in the other. And then you write out a list of everything you know how to do that your 93 year old grandmother does not know how to do. Because what you'll find is there's a really long list. So when it comes to video editing, social media, posting on YouTube, all those sorts of things. Once you create this list of all of these skills you have, then you look at that influencer list, those people that you wanna connect to, and you think, okay, I can't start with everybody. Let me start with one person. So who on here would really benefit 
from one of the skills on this list. And let's just lean into what you want to do, which is YouTubing. So let's look at somebody who has a YouTube account but could optimize a little better. So maybe it's a thumbnail for their videos. That's a really easy way to start. So take one of their most recent videos, create a custom thumbnail, send them an email and say, hey, I created a custom thumbnail for your last YouTube video. And just tr just test it out because uh, not everybody will write you back. Not everybody will, will say thank you and then they'll change it. But but you know maybe one out of 10, maybe, maybe one out of 20. Is it worth it to spend that time creating those custom thumbnails to try to get that person's attention to serve them well? Absolutely. And what might actually happen, which we've kind of talked about already, that one person when they say, I love the thumbnail, um, can you log in and do it for me, right? Can I hire you to do this on a regular basis? Like it just leads to more relationship. Yeah, and as we talked about earlier, creating some testimonials, talking about how that influencer influenced you and how that YouTuber impacted your life and, and even making highlight reels for that YouTuber, making shorter videos of their longer content, consolidating things yeah. or telling them, hey, you know, I noticed you have a bunch of videos around this topic what if you put a playlist together and here's the way that I would organize the playlist? You know, all those little things that you think as a lonely YouTuber that you can't possibly help that person, you absolutely can. They probably don't have a massive team dedicated to optimizing their YouTube channel. There are little wins that they're missing out on. And sometimes it's creating a little bit of content of your own that references theirs and highlights them and celebrates them and then sharing it on social media and being like, look, I'm advocating for you. I'm out there sharing your video with people. That's going to get their attention. That's going to make them think, oh, this person would be very valuable to have in my life. I mean, that's how you build a network. You add value to other people's lives. The problem that a lot of these questions are in line with are, how can I take this person's time? Or how can I take this person's attention? Or how can I get this person to do to something it. for me? And we have to flip that. The mindset has to be, what can I give this person that'll help them? And that foot in the door creates all these opportunities that you, for the most part, probably haven't even realized were there. You know, something else that we were chatting about this morning in our marketing meeting is that we had we have a, a Facebook group of all of our clients and we had noticed that there is in the last few years there is a mass there had been a bit of an exodus and people are I'm sorry I, there has been an exit and and people are starting to see the cracks in some of the social media which means they're going to be moving to other platforms and there is plenty of alt tech going around that's all new and all of these influencers are going to be wanting to jump there. But if you already know it very well, you have an opportunity then to control those uh, platforms for them or help them with them. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at TikTok, right? <laughs> it's like, hey, I, I storyboarded out some TikTok videos that you could use to promote your YouTube video. What do you think of these ideas? Right. You pitch some ideas over. These are all, if you're creative and you have time, which is a very valuable resource, but you don't have a network, which is the resource you're trying to get, then you're going to have to trade some of that time to grow the network. And that's how it works. And uh, I could tell you right now, <laughs> we have a number of teammates. I'm looking at you, Cam, who they demonstrated their value. And then we said, hey, Come welcome aboard. aboard the team. You know, we had uh, a girl reach out to me and say, hey, I noticed you guys aren't really active on Quora. So what if I took your podcast that have all this great content and created some Quora answers for you? Well, of course, I'm like, oh, that's a great thing. I never thought of that. And what do you know? Now she's a part of the AOC team. So these are all moments that are the side door where no one is banging. No one is coming around the side door asking for opportunities. Everyone instead is just flooding them with, I need this. I need that. Can I get your time? I'm special. Here's how I'm different than everyone else. And unfortunately, that's how you get lost in the shuffle. This one's from Nicoletta. She has a question about pitching her project. Hey, AJ and Johnny, I'm about to start an NGO that's about educating people on a sustainable lifestyle in my home country of Italy. This year, I will travel to a few conferences to network. My main concern is having a great elevator pitch. What are some ways for me to find out if my pitch is working? I have tested on my friends and family, of course, and they love it, but then maybe they're not the best test audience. Any idea on how I can perfect it before the first conference? Thanks, <sighs> Nicoletta. I have some ideas here. What are you thinking, Brian? You got a big smile yeah. on 
I do because I just I I understand like Nicoletta we've all been there mm-hmm. like we can relate to what it's like to have this baby project this thing you care so much about and you think everybody's gonna think your baby's beautiful but the reality is they don't care about your baby at all like they have no time at all for your baby and that is the hard reality but knowing that will give you some clarity so the question i'd ask to you nicoletta is who cares about that so who cares about italians people in italy living a sustainable lifestyle who cares it's probably italians who aren't living a sustainable lifestyle but have a pain point so chase the pain right dig into the pain that that NGO is going to to solve who already is doing good work in that space that you can come alongside serve them well right link arms with them help them get results and when you help people get results they inevitably say so what are you working on right now like sharing an uber with somebody or showing up at a conference and, and hang out with somebody eventually they'll they'll ask because they're curious what are you working on and that's the opportunity that you have to share it's not pitch, but to share what you're working on and to position it in a way that maybe they'll care about. I 100% agree. Understanding the pain is the most important thing. Everyone likes to focus on the benefits and focus on all the different bells and whistles that make them unique and special, but people are only motivated by solving problems and pain in their life. And if you can't tap into that, it's going to be a tough sell. Now, of course, The internet is here with a variety of tools to very easily test your ideas. You can create a Facebook landing page and run Facebook ads to these decision makers and see if they click them. And if they click them, you know, hey, I'm onto something. This language is working. Or if they don't click your ad, well, I got to change my pitch. I got to change the way I'm wording things. I'm not hitting on the pain. And these are simple tests you can spend $20, $30 on. Facebook clicks are not that expensive for you to get some real data. Also, I would say go to some meetup groups, go to some other gatherings that are free. You don't have to buy a ticket and start talking about your idea with people and noting when you're talking and sharing it with them. What are they expressing? What are they latching on to? What are they asking follow up questions about? Are they following it? Is it easy for them to understand or are they asking me a bunch of questions? Well, maybe the pitch is not as clear. You know, there are opportunities online and offline. You can create videos on YouTube. You can post them on Twitter. You could retweet some of these people that might be at the conference before you get there to start testing the language, the wording, and the problem that you're looking to address to see if there's actual people showing interest online first, then go to the conference and you'll have a much better pitch. And I think it's fascinating that, you know, we've talked about the elevator pitch a few times here on these uh, podcasts recently on networking, but also in the past. And to be honest, a lot of times these networking events are less about making a decision on the spot and getting pitched to. In fact, a lot of networking events have strict rules around pitching, no pitching, because it's about fostering relationships. So going to these events and thinking about all the decision makers that you'd like to have on board, maybe mentoring you, think about how you can add to their life first As we said earlier, you add some value to their life and then they turn around and go, well, what is it that you're working through, Nicoletta? What is it that you're hoping to get? Oh, you're starting an NGO? And now they're gonna be much more warm and receptive to that pitch than just cold walking up to them after they get off stage and say, hey, what do you think of this idea, right? Because as we know, there are a plethora of ideas. It's the execution. It's showing that person that if I partner with you, you're going to follow through. You're going to be someone that's worth my time, which is incredibly valuable. So showing them that you're willing to go out of your way and shoot a video of them on stage, create a little social media asset that they can share after their talk, that you're going to add value to their life. Then when you do have an opportunity to pitch them, they're going to know you're going to follow through. It's worth supporting you on this mission. The last question we have today is about relationships. I found that with my ex, who I was with for 11 years until earlier this year, that when we were out with other people at the pub or at other people's houses, etc., I would struggle to interact with her. And thinking about it, maybe subconsciously thought that whilst we were out with friends, that I should chat to them and that I would chat with her when I was back home. 
I've definitely noticed that when out with other couples, they still interact with each other, both serious, pragmatic chats, but also friendly banter and showing each other that they cared for one another. I was wondering whether the way I was is common or not, and whether you guys had any tips to help with this. Well, that's so good. When it comes to relationships, how do you communicate with your spouse? Yeah, I've, we've been married 17 years now, and you know, in my world, we go to a lot of parties and networking events and conferences and things like that. So I think even early on, um, it's just the conversation before the event. You know, that's where it starts. It's just, hey, you know, like, so I'm, her name's Julie. So I'd say, hey, Joel, like this thing, like there's a few people I really want to meet. So are you, are you cool? And she's like, yeah, totally cool. And that means like she's going to go kind of handle like meeting people herself and I'm going to go off and I'm going to meet people. And that's totally fine. It's like, how can you set the expectation ahead of time? In the same way, you know, if we're going to uh, some sort of a conference thing that's more like my thing, I can say like, hey, this is this is what I'd love to accomplish while I'm here. I'd love to meet a couple of these people, but I'd really love you to introduce you to this one person or whatever it is. And then that way she knows, like when she looks across, uh, looks to me, uh, makes eye contact from across the room, and I'm like, you know, come on over here, like kind of like nodding at her. She knows that that means like, come, like let's let's introduce ourselves to this particular person. So I think that's the challenge. It's how can you have the conversation before the event so that you're all you're both on the same page. But I got to tell you guys, you know, 41 years old, married for 17 years, it's awesome to be at an event with yeah. your spouse. Like I would say it doesn't sound like it was the right relationship match because I are you kidding me? I can't wait to show her off if you will like to introduce her to people because i'm like you think i'm pretty good you should meet my wife she is incredible because she always has some wisdom or insight or something interesting to bring to the uh, to the conversation i really like that and the other thing is well your spouse and you to your spouse you should be your biggest fans for each other and they cannot yes. cheer you on if they don't have any clarity and what you're working on and i that's Obviously, your message has been clarity for yourself and for those who are around you. And I, I love that. I think a couple things I'd like to add on here. Um, certainly agree that setting expectations before having a conversation in the car ride over to the house party or to the pub of, you know, what are you looking forward to this evening? What are you excited about? I was thinking about running off and, and talking to all your friends and maybe hear from them. No, actually, I'd prefer, you know, we spent some time together. I feel like I haven't seen you all week, right? So there's the expectations. Then there's also the after the event, the check-in, right? How would you like that event? What would you think? What didn't you like? And, and share and be open and honest so that you can get that feedback. Because I feel like what he's explaining here is a lack of communication, a lack of expectation setting, and then a lack of a check-in after of like, well, was that a fun event for her? Because I felt like it was great. And if she didn't feel like it was great, well then maybe you need to switch up some of what you're doing and some of your behaviors. The last piece I wanna talk about, and, and this is a, a topic we went in depth on on an earlier podcast, is the five love languages. And we all express love and affection mm -hmm. for others in different ways. And we have different expectations of how we need to receive it as well. And a lot of times what we're talking about here is a mismatch where you think you're expressing love and your partner doesn't feel it as that expression of love. So being clear on your partner's love language, is it quality time together? Well, then she's probably gonna expect some quality of time even when you are out in a group. Uh, is it words of affirmation? Is it letting her know, wow, you did such a great job uh, pitching the business for me, that was so awesome, or wow, I love when you tell that story. Uh, you really had the whole party's attention, that was fantastic. You know, those small things go a long way towards smoothing over this miscommunication that seems to be going on. And I will tell you that, as we said earlier, everyone has different temperaments. You know, <laughs> she just may be really introverted. And, and because of that, she feels a little clingy in these situations because she doesn't always know what to say. She feels a little anxiety or she could be the opposite where she's really independent and she doesn't want you at her side. She wants to be able to have her own conversations and talk to people and then come back to you. But if, if you're not understanding and communicating your temperament, your love languages, what you need to feel fulfilled, then of course we're gonna have these struggles in relationships. Now, we love to give our listeners a challenge each week and one of the exercises in your book is about saying thank you. We thought it'd be such a fitting exercise for the final episode of our month on networking. Could you explain this exercise to our listeners? 
Oh, absolutely. You know, saying saying thank you just goes such a long way. And for years, I struggled to write thank you notes. I think that's like the premier, you know, level, the top tier of saying thank you. When whenever I move, I just moved my office around this last weekend, and as I was going through like these just piles of paper that I had to, you know, get rid of or whatever, the 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 ones that I had the trouble throwing away were the thank you notes right. because I want to I want to hang yeah. on to them, right? Like they really really matter. So. Thank you notes. You could say things like, you, you know, you did a great job. Thanks for helping me in a certain way. Uh, maybe somebody answered your question, writing them a thank you note and saying, thanks for answering my question. Uh, they gave you an opportunity. Maybe they introduced you to somebody. So what I want you guys to do is to look back over the last couple months, just even look at your calendar or look at your social media and look at a couple people that helped you out in some way. And now turn back to them and say thank you. So there's there's like two or three ways to do that. One is to write that handwritten thank you note. You can hit somebody up on Instagram or on Facebook Messenger to say, hey, can you send me your mailing address? And most people will send it because they know you're gonna mail them something cool, yep. right? And so then write a little personal thank you note. For those of you that are really working on your personal branding, you could even get some custom thank you notes printed. There's a lot of places that will do that. That really kind of takes your you know, your art of charm to the next level because you've got these these custom thank you notes and write them a note and just say, this specifically is what you did. I, it really mattered. It really helped me in this way. And I just want to say thank you. So you could do that. Another way to do it is to create a little video and just send it uh, through Instagram or through, through through Facebook. And guys, what I did right before right before we launched the book is I knew that like book launch day was gonna be so busy, but I wanted to tell people on book launch day how grateful I was for them. So a week before the book came out, when I still had some space and some time available, is I went on a walk around this local park. I took out my phone and I just recorded these 30 second thank you videos. I recorded 40 of them. And I sent them to my team with the directive that on book launch day, message these to all these people that I'm saying thank you to. And it mattered. Like I got messages from people left and right saying, thank you so much. I know you're super busy and it just really means a lot that you'd recognize and say thank you. So there, there are a couple ways to do it. What do you guys think? I really enjoy that. Absolutely. Especially when people are giving you words of advice, they're inspiring you, yes. they're <laughs> taking action in ways that influence your life to be thankful, to show that gratitude. Not only does it help grow your network, but it also helps with your mental health. It puts you in a place of expressing gratitude, which is much better than a place of expressing contempt, criticism, and focusing on the negative. So that's a great, powerful habit to put together. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciated the answers you had to these listener questions. You added a lot to this episode. And for our listeners who are curious to find out more about you, where can they find you? I know you have a kick-ass podcast as well. Yeah, you know, one of the best things that you guys can do, follow me on Instagram. It's Brian J. Dixon on Instagram and send me a message. Yeah. Let me know what's what's one thing that you heard in this show today that impacted you or what's one follow up question you have. I, I love responding to DMs and I think that's the best way to continue the conversation. Uh, you know, obviously you can get the book. The book is called Start With Your People. It's available on Amazon, audio listeners. We've got one on Audible. You know, I recorded the audio book, so that's, that's super fun as well. But guys, I'm just so honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Lots of great stuff here today. And in fact, I, there's a few mental notes I had taken just from listening to this, uh, for doing this podcast, so I'm really excited. And very actionable, yeah. which is what we really appreciate. Our audience can benefit. Thank you so much, Brian. But I feel alive.